All right, so let's talk a little bit about the Sienna Solutions Challenge. So what is the Sienna Solutions Challenge? Uh, it's a global design challenge that invites students and teachers to design solutions to real world problems and scenarios and taking actionable steps to build a better world. Um, maybe your students have a interest in exploring a big idea or an issue that they're really passionate about, um, maybe happening in their community or their, their neighborhood, um, and they want to investigate or research a little bit more on. This challenge will really help them to design and innovate uh, creative solutions and designs um, for, again, to in an effort to building a better world around them. And so if you're, this is your first time maybe hearing about Digital Promise, I just kind of want to give you a little bit of context on what we do and how we collaborate with Sienna. So Digital Promise is a nonprofit organization that builds powerful networks and takes on grand challenges by working at the intersection of researchers, entrepreneurs, and educators. And our vision is that all people at every stage of their lives have the ability and the access to learn experiences in learning experiences that help them to acquire the knowledge and skills they need to thrive and continuously learn in an ever-changing world. And so we were able to uh, collaborate with Sienna, which is a networking system, services, and software company um, in an effort to kind of help uh, Sienna's digital inclusion um, program to sort of be amplified and enhanced. And so their digital inclusion program really aims to mobilize the company's global workforce, leverage its innovation leadership, and collaborate with customers and suppliers and other partners all over the world to sort of bridge that digital divide. Uh, and Sienna, um, again, has committed to fund $10 million USD of over a five-year period on programming that promotes digital inclusion, uh, through greater connectivity, access to technology, and digital skilling, um, with a goal of expanding opportunities for 100,000 underserved students in our global communities. And so we were able, we've been able um, to collaborate with Sienna on a really um, intimate level that will, again, really help um, students really, you know, to create their innovations around um, around them. So we're really excited and about the second year of uh, continuing the Sienna Solutions Challenge. Uh, and so the next generation of problem solvers, we acknowledge that, you know, students um, all over the world really need real world experiences to help them to see the design world and its impact on people. We recognize that when students have the opportunities to collaborate with folks um, in their community or maybe folks that are new to them, they're able to empathize um, across differences. And with that, we are able to really acknowledge that students can acquire a diverse set of skills that will help them to redesign the world that they see around them, help them to reimagine you know, what life uh, maybe has looked like for however you know, long it has and help them to, this challenge really helps students to put themselves in the center of the issue and really kind of see, you know, with collaboration and um, facilitation from educators, how can students, you know, student teams really work together to make a positive contribution to their community. So when choosing a big idea, educators and students are encouraged to Consider the intersectionality of the sustainable development goals that are developed by the United Nations in deciding how they will make a positive contribution into their community. So you can see um, some of the, S uh, the 17 SDGs that are developed um, by the United Nations. And so educators and students really work together to identify, you know, how does this challenge in um, our neighborhood, maybe it's you know, there's lots of traffic in um, large intersections that impede on um, my way of getting to school. That can be sort of an example. And from that, um, educators will work with their student teams to identify what that looks like in, in reference to the sustainable development goals. So I want to talk a little bit about that. Um, and so I just also wanted to mention that, you know, how or talk a little bit about how this Sienna Solutions Challenge really impacts how students learn. 
Uh, students are encouraged to really think big through this challenge. They're, they're encouraged to think really big and really broad about an idea or an issue or a challenge that's sort of impacting them in their neighborhood or their community. Really ask thoughtful questions and investigate, you know, um, keep asking those big whys, which uh, for students around this age could feel a little, you know, um, daunting in some cases, but when you have the support of your team and your educators um, to facilitate that, they are able to really kind of think outside the box. And ultimately, you know, the idea is that they are able to develop a meaningful and actionable solution. So they don't necessarily have to have the final answer, but, you know, coming, uh, developing a design can help them reach that larger goal. And so uh, this challenge invites educators to engage in the challenge-based learning framework that you see here. Um, and again, it invites students to engage in a big idea, investigate and develop a guiding questions and really act on a solution um, in an effort to implement that in their, in their communities. And so um, I just kind of wanted to talk a little bit about what we saw last year from our 2022 uh, Sienna Solutions Challenge awardees. And so in March 2022, uh, so earlier this year, we were able to announce um, and award the first 17 uh, awardees uh, that participated in the Sienna Solutions Challenge and received a $2,500 um, awards to sustain and to scale and to sustain and scale their projects and designs. And so, you, as you can see on the screen, uh, we have received projects from really all over. Um, but specifically, these seventeen awardees really kind of um, knocked the ball out the park, if you will, and and really were able to to advance um, into that into their goals. And so um, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, one or a couple of projects that we saw. Um, one was a, a based from Columbia. Um, and so this educator and her students that you can see here, they really focus on the big idea of cultural heritage and what that means for their for their community and what that has means for their students. And so students had the question of, you know, how can we as young people um, retrieve the stories and memories of our ancestors. And so uh, as a solution or action concept, uh, the student team worked together to design a blog uh, with the youth of, their, of the indigenous community um, using smartphones to collect audio and video to preserve the stories of their elders. And so it was really exciting to see how they were able to collaborate with their educator along with folks in their community to really get that audio and that visual and so you know real time accounts um, and how they were able to kind of advance that and share it in a way that is uh, viewable and accessible by people all over the world um, through a blog and so that's one way this is one example of uh of you know kids really taking what they see happening in their community or something that they're wondering about and they want to act on it. And another example that we um, saw from our awardees is from the Be the Dream Farm Irrigation System in Botswana, um, excuse me, the team is called the Dream Factory Foundation. And uh, they um, also wanted to create a water irrigation system um, due to you know, some of the water issues that they were um, experiencing in their community. Uh, and their essential question you know, is how can we as a team uh, create or make uh, what we learn in a practical, fun, and relevant way to our daily lives? And as a solution, they were able to create an educational farm to engage learners in building their own irrigation system and learning agricultural and practical life skills. And after a workshop using Google CS First, uh, they learned about basic coding, 3D design, um, and they now have a, a visual representation or a, a sort of a blueprint of what their water irrigation system will look like. Um, and so, you know, just based off of what we saw um, now that they have the blueprint and they have the visual representation, what they'll do with their award is sort of find ways to sustain and scale that and, and make it even larger. Um, so I just kind of wanted to give you all an insight of, of what we saw from our awardees last year. And 
Um, this is also really important and really exciting. You know, we, like I said, we've received several, uh, so many um, projects um, that were submitted to our online gallery. And so that is the what the image that you see here. Um, we have an online gallery where all projects are considered for the, um, to, to be viewed and, and posted to our online gallery. And the gallery will highlight products created by your students. Um, and so, you know, I'll, I'll go over a little bit of this at the end, but I do want to just mention, you know, all projects, again, are um, invited and encouraged to be submitted to the Sienna Solutions Challenge. There is no set number of how many projects you can submit to the online gallery. Uh, however, for the Sustainability Award, if you would like to um, consider one of your projects to be um, considered for the Sustainability Award, uh, you can only select up to five to be considered for the Sustainability Award. So say you have 11 projects that your students created um, and they want to submit all of them to the online gallery, that's perfectly fine. And out of those 11, you want, to, or students only want to select maybe three of the projects to be considered for an award, that can totally happen um, as long as it's no more than five. So I just wanted to mention that. Um, so let's see. So let's talk a little bit about how uh, you can participate in the Sienna Solutions Challenge. And so who is eligible to participate in school and out of school educators and teachers from all over the world? Uh, this is not limited to just K-12. We um, are looking for librarians, uh, folks that work in museums or after school programs. Um, as long as these educators have contact and, and relationships with middle and high school students um, with the educational level equivalent to ages 11 to 19 years of age, uh, they are eligible to participate. And so you don't necessarily have to be a traditional teacher in a K-12 school, but um, we are looking for folks that you know, work with students um, in middle and high school um, areas. And what types of designs can my students submit? So this is a really exciting part. Uh, students are really encouraged to leverage digital tools and technologies in their actions and solutions. And so we're not looking for, you know, students to use the most fanciest technology, you know, or something the most expensive. Uh, the really the focus is that they're able to design an actionable uh, solution using resources and technologies. Uh, that are accessible to them. And so a student can uh, create a product or a device, a campaign or a piece of media, a physical or digital environment, an experience or system, or maybe something else. You are welcome to surprise us. Uh, we saw lots of different, um, as you can see on, on All Eye Gallery, we had lots of different submissions from campaigns, blog posts, podcast episodes, um, presentations, you know, just a, a, a wide array of, of things. We, one of our actually um, folks that we, it looks like we have a couple of folks that participated in the challenge last year. So if they would love to talk about what their students submitted last year, that would be awesome. But we saw some really, really creative things. And so there's no limit um, to what students can create. Uh, so this is just kind of helping them to think about, you know, what they can create that will make a better world um, around them. And so, you know, what should you do to get started? Uh, if you are, were able to attend this webinar, that means that you likely either received an email or a newsletter, or um, you might have been a, you know, an educator on our, you might have already registered for the Sienna Challenge. So that's awesome. You're already on the right start. Uh, but if you know anyone who would like to get started, uh, please invite them to register for the Sienna Challenge dot, um, as an educator on the SiennaChallenge.org. This is how we are able to communicate um, any live events that, that are happening. We're we're, we are able to communicate with them. They'll be added to our newsletter uh, where they'll receive uh, key dates and just information and news about the challenge. Um, and really, you know, the next step 
after registering is familiarizing yourself with the educator dashboard. You can see the little arrow that's pointing to uh, the login. Once you're able to log in, you'll be invited to you know, kind of see your dashboard. Um, and on the dashboard, this is where uh, you can submit your projects um, to you know, participate in, in the challenge. Um, you're able to bookmark any recommended resources that we have in our resource library. You're also able to view older webinars and register for new live webinars using the educator dashboard. So the educator dashboard is really, really important. It's where we keep all of our you know, most up-to-date uh, information, including our newsletter. Um, so that is another way to get started. And if you're brand new to the challenge, or if you participated last year, but you want a refresher, and maybe you're looking for uh, some new ways to engage your students, I would encourage you, highly encourage you to download the, the Sienna Solutions Challenge Facilitator's Guide. This guide will really kind of give you an insight to, you know, as an educator, you know, what should you be doing or how can you be supporting your student teams um, throughout, the, th throughout their journeys. So you can find this facilitator's guide on the educator dashboard. You can also find it on the resource library that I'll talk about um, a little bit more later. Um, so this is, you know, some information how to get started. Um, and in addition to the Sienna Solutions Challenge um, and the Sustainability Award, uh, we are at Digital Promise providing uh, professional development for educators to participate in. Um, and so we'll be providing, you know, like I said, professional development mentor and mentoring for um, educators as they help to sort of get their students to reach their goals. Um, and so we'll have We'll be hosting live monthly webinars that are really um, get in deep about you know different parts of the challenge, areas that you may be struggling on, that you're looking for you know some ways to collaborate with maybe other folks on the call or even our um, subject matter experts here at Digital Promise. Um, we also have Twitter chats um, uh, using the hashtag Sienna Challenge. So if you are really active on Twitter. Um, so are we. We have uh, monthly um, Twitter chats where we'll bring in some other folks in the educational space to discuss, you know, uh, things around the, the Sienna Challenge, sustainable development goals, and how it really sort of impacts you as an educator um, and helps you sort of think a little bit more along with other educators that are participating or, you know, some that are, just want to have a conversation in the space. Um, and like I said, the other piece of really valuable piece that really doesn't take much from us, but more so from you, um, is to really browse the education, the educator resource library. So uh, the resource library has a bunch of resources that are both that are all free um, for educators and students to use throughout the challenge. And so if you're new to the challenge or if you're, you know, starting over and this is your second year and you want to maybe use some different techniques or strategies to engage your students. Maybe you're looking for new ways for them to investigate their activities um, and maybe their questions. Uh, the resource library is the, is the place for you. Um, you are able to kind of like download it. They're available in English, Spanish, and French. Um, we are working on getting more languages. So I know that it was a big question last year, um, but that is our goal at Digital Promise to really kind of help to expand the resource library so it's accessible to, and available for everyone. Um, so I would highly, highly encourage you to uh, browse the Educator Resource Library and you can start with the table of contents um, if you are totally clueless and need a little bit more guidance to uh, navigate the space. And um, so here are just the key dates and the timelines uh, and the timeline for the Sienna Challenge. And so the project submission, submissions have already opened. So the application is available. Um, it opened up on September 6th, so earlier this week. Um, and the deadline to submit your projects by is March 1st, 2023. So throughout this time from September to March, students should really be, educators and students should really be working together to consider, you know, what are the chat, what's the challenge that we want to tackle, um, and then sort of go straight, straight ahead, full steam ahead. 
Um, the awards will be announced in April of 2023. And then in May of 2023, we'll be hosting what's called a Youth Made Festival. Um, and that'll also be our second year of hosting it. It's a, a two week online event, a virtual event where we'll be celebrating um, creators, youth, cre youth media, youth creators who are um, sort of sharing their content, maybe they're in media or design, or they participated in the Sienna Solutions Challenge. That is an opportunity for um, educators and student, really student teams and youth to uh, participate in and share what they were able to create throughout the year. And so you can also find this, uh, the challenge timeline on SiennaChallenge.org under About the Challenge. And so we keep that page up to date pretty frequently. Um, and the last part of this, I kind of wanted to, I noticed that there were a few questions in the registration page. If you were able to ask a question, if you were able to register, you may have saw a little area where you can add your questions in advance. So I wanted to address some of these um, before opening up the space for you all to add it, ask additional questions. Um, so the first question uh, that I found was, you know, if I participated in the, I participated in the challenge in 2022 and received a sustainability award, can I participate again this year? The answer to that is yes, you can absolutely participate in the challenge again this year. However, you will need to obviously develop new activities and, um, you know, through our um, sort of judging um, system and process, we will be really looking for, you know, sufficient evidence um, that new activities were formed and, and really kind of looking to see like how um, either you were able to sustain and scale or, you know, really just uh, on your challenge last year, or if you have a brand new big idea that your students want to participate in, you know, it would just have to be around um, using new activities. Uh, how do I upload my students' projects? Uh, in your educator dashboard, like I mentioned before, once you're registered, you'll go to the educator dashboard. And in your educator dashboard, dra dashboard you'll see a link that's a really big banner that says uh, submit a project. And once your project is submitted, uh, you'll be taken to an application page. And once that is submitted, you'll be brought to a My Projects page. And under My Projects, is where you can submit your award um, applications. So in a way, there's sort of two applications, one for you know, just kind of laying, laying out your projects and, and all that you've designed. And then the additional uh, application is for the, for the sustainability award. Um, how do we choose an SDG to address? Which I thought was an amazing question because that actually has more to do with your students and, your, and you as an educator to kind of really engage them in you know, things that are happening in their community. And so um, as a recommendation from us, we uh, recommend that you, you know, kind of really have some opportunities to have deep conversations with your students about, again, issues that they recognize that are happening in their community. And once those issues are recognized, um, kind, of a, kind of take an, an opportunity to see how those align with this SDGs. Um, I wouldn't get so hung up on making them, you know, connect exactly, but you can use one or several of SDGs if they're, if, if your, you know, issue or challenge um, calls for it. So uh, you can really kind of take the reins um, on your own and, and with your, with your students, because that is where the conversation really um, grows from. Um, how many projects can we submit? I mentioned this before, but I wanted to mention it again. Um, educators can submit as many projects as you'd like to the online gallery, and we will consider, um, you know, through our judging process, um, how, you know, which projects will be um, uh, viewed in or added to the online gallery. However, only five of those projects can be considered for an award. So I just wanted to mention that. Um, and can multiple projects at a school win a sustainability award? And this was a question that came up a lot last year. And so I wanted to make sure to address it now. Um, educators from the same educational organization may submit entries to the Sienna Solutions Challenge Awards program. However, only one winning entry from a single educational organization will be selected for 
a sustainable, uh, excuse me, for a sustainable a sustainability award. I have lots of words today. Um, so um, that basically means that you know you can you can submit as many projects as you'd like to be considered for the for the award. Um, however, only one winning entry will will be selected, and that is so that we're maintaining equity amongst all applicants um, and all educators and student teams, and we want to make sure that you know we're providing opportunities for everyone. Um, however, you know if you are an educator that wants to collaborate with another educator, that is totally welcome. Um, so if educators from a school or an organization um, are, they're welcome to form a partnership um, when enrolling in the Sienna Solutions Challenge. And if you're interested in participating in the challenge with other teachers at your organization um, as a small group or partnership, we ask that you really consider how you will support students to collaborate with one another. Um, and so, the, those are the questions and answers that I hope uh, I was able to answer in this in this section. Um, so I'm going to stop talking because I've been talking for some time, and I'm going to open up the floor if there are any other questions um, that anyone else wants to ask. Hello. Hi. Can you hear me? Hi. Yes. Hi. Um, I'm from Kazakhstan. Uh, my name is Jana Noor. Uh, sorry that I'm not <laughs> using my camera because it's almost like, <laughs> I guess, nine. Yes, in the evening, I don't look, <laughs> I look more like, you know, housewife. I don't have like professional outfit, maybe. So, um, so yeah. my question is thank you for your presentation. It was really clear when there were many questions, but now it's kind of a, I, I, I got the answers. Uh, so my question is, since it's a, like a um, low, I guess more like we're gonna, uh, so we are doing this uh, uh, project in our country, let's say from Kazakhstan, yes. So so definitely we'll be using our language like Kazakh language because we, people don't understand English. So my question is that, can you accept uh, evidence anything that is done in our community, like in Kazakh, uh, in Kazakh. So can you accept evidence in Kazakh? In, uh, and of course, uh, English is the language that you understand. And we, if we just describe this project in English, but there will be some like content evidence in Kazakh language. That was my first question. <laughs> just the first question. Should I ask second or no? <laughs> I can answer your first question. Okay, and, thank you. All right. Yep. Okay, great. Thank you. So, yeah, so great question. Um, you can absolutely submit any artifacts that are in another language. You can submit that. However, when you're completing your application um, or submitting your project application to both the online gallery and the sustainability award, we do ask that those be written in English. Um, but however, you know, you're, there are, if there are other maybe artifacts that need to be in um, Kazakh or in, your, in the language of your own, um, that is acceptable. And you can find some, um, we have more language on that um, on our frequently asked questions. We specifically call the language part out. So does that answer your first question? Yeah, thank you very much. And this uh, regarding application, like the regarding our product that like this question brings to the another question so if, so that is is it okay if our application will be in kazakh so that's a work like almost uh, the another question yeah uh, and can we use existing uh, applications i mean uh, sometimes like our students cannot create applications themselves because they don't know this coding language because i'm teaching like eighth grade students Mm -hmm. uh, can they use existing applications such as like Canva or like something that that is already like done by somebody but free, for example, yes? Uh, and we can, for example, create content using this application. Thank you very much. Um, I want to make sure I'm, I'm hearing your question correctly. Um, are you asking if your students need to create their own application? So what what is meant by creating own application? Like here uh, in our school, we also ask to do some research and create some application. But if we use some existing uh, some uh, 
apps, let's say Quizlet, I don't know, Canva, they also have applications, yes. Uh, but we want to create uh, like something new for my local community because uh, uniqueness depends on uh, community, yes. For, for maybe America, uh, something that is unique for America could be uh, something new for my country, right? And if we try, uh, let's say, creating some content, but we don't have tools, like we don't, my, oh, my students can't, can't that. Yes, sir? all right, thank you very much. Yes, I see what you're asking. Can your students essentially use Canva or different types of programs um, to create their design? Is that what I'm yeah, hearing? Yeah, yeah they yes. are content. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. They can absolutely use any, again, any um, resources or software that's available to them. They're totally invited to use those. Um, one thing I hadn't mentioned in the slide deck, but I want to mention now, and again, you can find all of this information on our website. When your students are completing um, you know, the challenge, part, one part of the challenge, or excuse me, one part of the application is uh, an, as a PowerPoint presentation. So the PowerPoint presentation or a set of slides will be um, required as part of the application. And that PowerPoint really will be able to tell, give us an, a story or like um, an overview of your student team journey on their challenge. And so they can use Canva if they wanted to or PowerPoint or Google Slides to create those slides and really kind of go into depth on you know where um, through in 15 slides. Sorry, I wanted to mention that too. Um, in 15 slides, you know, give us an insight on how your student team in, engaged in the um, in the in their issue or the challenge, ways that they investigated, and you know, sort of give us a really good insight of what that looked like and what action they actually took. And so. Um, that's part of the application. The PowerPoint slides should be developed by students. Um, the application itself, we ask that educators uh, complete the application itself and submit it on behalf of the student team. So I hope that answers your question. Yeah, thank you very much. So I, I got you. Thank you very much. No problem. I see that we have, um, I'm just looking in our chat box. Sorry, I'm a little, I can't look at the chat box and, and uh, do the slide. <laughs> I'm just looking at everything, but um, we do have uh, Will Kavada in, in the room. Um, thanks for joining Will and thanks for your feedback. Um, Will was also one of our uh, awardees from last year. And so Will, if you want to share any insight, um, if you want to, you don't have to um, share any insight about your experience, that that would be great um, and maybe helpful to some other folks. And he might actually be in class. So if he's not able to, I think that's okay. <laughs> um, if there are any other questions, I'd love to take this time to answer them. May I ask one more question? I just want to understand, uh, like how, uh, let's say, um, I forgot the word. Okay, my question is, uh, how many like projects do you receive, and what is the probability? And how many? Do you have any uh, like facts about projects and the number of uh, grants, like not, not the number of winners? So mm. if you if there are like let's say two thousand, I'm I'm just interested probability. So. Uh, in, uh, I want to inspire my students. Of course, first of all, they should enjoy the process, but they should know that this process is going to be real realized or recognized globally. Mm -hmm. That's a great question. Uh, so we hope to award 20 um, educational institutions or organizations. So that's our hope. Last year, like I said, we, have, we awarded 17 um, awardees and we received 58 projects, if I'm, if I'm correct at that, we received in total 58 projects from uh, student teams all over the world. And so we hope to get a bigger increase, maybe even double um, this year of the amount of projects that are, that will be submitted. Um, but we hope to award 20 um, institutions uh, this year. Does that help? Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Great.
Kerisa, I wanted a clarification. I mean, I'm basing on what was shared with Sienna internally. Is uh, I saw 258 uh, projects submitted. Is that not right? I think that actually, that actually might be right. Sorry, I have there's lots of different numbers. Um, that we and have. then uh, 50 were um, so you're right. 17 were awarded, and I believe. 50 of them were selected for online gallery. Yes, that's correct. That's yeah. correct. Thank you for yeah. the clarification, Padma. So we actually had yeah. a lot more that were submitted. Yeah, exactly. Also, but 58, yes. So 58 projects were were um, yeah. were considered for the for the gallery. Yes. Um, and there's a lot of information. Something uh, that we added to our website that is new is our blog. So we have a blog segment on our uh, on SiennaChallenge.org, and so I, um, you're invited to share that material in the blogs that are written by folks at Digital Promise, and we have some great um, blogs that are written by our awardees from 2022, uh, and they are just kind of giving you a real time account of their experience in the challenge, and so. Um, and with that information, you're able to kind of share that with your students to give them an, an idea of, you know, what what uh, what engagement looked like last year. So, uh, Carissa, if I may say, can I share uh, something from uh, my experience? Sure. So, in a way, we were probably the unique team that of, um, facilitators are not educators and our kids are from all over the country in the United States, different states. It's all fully virtual. And also um, to <laughs> add to the more complexity, the kids, uh, half of them neurotypical, neurodiverse. And what we have experienced, um, we were as facilitator, we were thrilled. At some point we thought, okay, I mean, these, these guys won't make it, meaning won't be able to do much but don't get discouraged and keep the one thing if i take away from our experience was focusing on engagement not so much where they are in the process it can get discouraging if you focus on that uh, but if you keep uh, them engaged and have them meet uh, often um, virtual has a different challenges but that's kind of helped even when they felt like they couldn't do anything, but just having them have brainstorming sessions, not worry about where they should be or they want it to be. I think that really helped us. And at the end, we ourselves, it surprised how much they ended up doing compared to along the way when we thought, we really thought, even though we were quite encouraging students, we really thought, okay, I guess we have to settle for less <laughs> in our mind, but and say, okay, let's not bog down by that. I think that mindset is very important and it's a great lesson even for young adults to uh, young kids and adults to know you do experience sometimes like that. That's real. That's real life. I think that's a great takeaway for both as facilitators and also as students. So thank you for the, we kept true to the nature that they have to figure out everything. We are, we are here to um, facilitate and help them to face challenges. Thank you so much for that, Padma. You mentioned so many great insights. Um, and one of that, one of them being like really focus on, on the process and, and, and trusting it and trusting that students, you know, will take, <laughs> their ideas to into yeah. their own hands and that is the that's the most exciting part about this project is that students are really able to you know learn for themselves with with each other um through yeah. investigation and and really um I, I mean we've heard so many accounts um one of them with with one educator i think maybe was a us based educator and basically said you know my students want to learn on their own now like you don't have to encourage them or kind of, you know, um, do things that that they, they, you know, they just really found a lot of investment and agency in this type of challenge. And so 
uh, we we want to stress that this is totally student led and and you'll be surprised like like Padma said um, at how much students really take ownership um, and agency of of things that they create. So yeah, keeping really open. One of the student totally. Our mom from the beginning said, I don't know if my daughter is really contributing. We kept encouraging up at the end. The mom was blown away by what she had learned. She, her daughter has communication challenges and also intellect, some of the intellectual challenges. Um, but to her surprise, she has contributed so meaningfully and inspire other kids that's the biggest thing and mom accepted i was so wrong about my daughter my world has changed now and that her daughter now is going through certification to work in preschool which such a thought wouldn't have even occurred let alone acting on it so it's just in there are lives changing events occurred within this. Thank you for the framework. That's amazing. Awesome. Well, I'm gonna just go on to the next slide. Um, we have, we're a little over, but this is the last thing I wanted to mention. Um, so in terms of next steps, you know, register, share the word. Um, we are hosting an educator roundtable on September 28th. At, um, with us four educators from all over the world. One of them is actually on the call today. Hi, Samuel. Um, so uh, we'll be um, essentially just kind of hearing from our educators and conversation on how the challenge supported teacher-student relationships and how they were able to find an authentic purpose for learning through the challenge. And so I'm gonna share the, the registration link in the chat box so that you are able to um, register for it. Um, and so we hope that you know, we'll see you all again um, on September 28th at the Educator Roundtable. And you know, if you have any questions at all, please feel free to email me um, directly. I'm gonna add my uh, email address to the chat box. And that is all that I have. Thank you so much for joining everyone. Really appreciate your time. And again, if you have any questions at all about the challenge, feel free to email me.